This is our first sermon on systematic theology. Theology is a means of study of God. We're living in a time today that people do not want to study deep theology. They all they want is a feel-good sermon. Uh, they want to have uh, fire insurance that they're not going to hell. And that's about the sum total of religion. No one wants to hear doctrine. That's bare bottom. It's forbidden subject today. Nobody wants to talk about hell in all reality. Hell is a doctrine. Now we're going to be start this series of messages on systematic theology. My textbook for this is Lectures in Systematic Theology by Thiessen. This is the one that I studied when I was in the seminary 40 years ago. It is a, a great book. I'll be reading to you from page 23 in his book, chapter 1, The Necessity and Nature of Theology. The Nature and Necessity of Theology. The writer begins, Until rather recent times, theology was considered the queen of sciences. Do you know that at one time, if you were a lawyer, you had to have a Ph.D.? Uh, you had to have your doctorate in theology first because they considered the Bible the basis of all law. If you were a doctor, you had to have a Ph.D. You had to have your doctorate in, 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 in the Bible first. First. You had to have a doctor of divinity first before you did any studying in medicine. And medicine in the early days it, it was a like a you were a, a student under a doctor. You were a student under a doctor. You just watched what he did and learned to do it also. But the first, the first necessity was to learn about God theology. Now all lawyers today, if they had a doctorate of divinity before they practiced law, we would be a lot safer place for us today. One thing I might say this also in England. In England, <clears throat> if you become an attorney, a barrister at the bar, you have to swear allegiance to the queen first of all, rather than your subjects that you're defending. Nor can you defend a man to be innocent when he is not innocent. Well, would America be a little better off if they took after the mother country just a little bit in that avenue? Until rather recent times, theology was considered the queen of sciences and systematic theology the crown of the queen. But today, the generality of so-called theological scholarship denies that it is a science. The Bible when you study the Bible scientifically, you have a science and medicine, anthropology, everything, archaeology, all rolled into one beautiful woven tapestry. I've stood before this chart for 40 something years. I've got it up here in Fish Lake Valley in our little cookhouse. And it's nice and warm here tonight with our Kalamazoo stove. Uh, keeping us warm, nothing else but the Kalamazoo wood, wood burning cook stove and with our brand new Mormon ovens from Appleton, Wisconsin that Steve, uh, KE9LZ, shipped for us and put it out here so we could put them on our stove. That's a great asset to the stove and it keeps us warm and it's, this is how we cook our food here. I thought I'd just make that mention of that in, in passing. If you look over here to the chart, now look at the chart, I've got my little pointer here. In eternity past, in eternity past, God was. In John 1 1, it says, In RK, ain't ho logos, kai ho logos, ain't pro stone thing on kai ho logos, ain't theos. In beginning, the absolute beginning of all, when only God existed, he kept on being the God and the, the, the 
word kept on being God and the word there is a Hebrewism from the word Hadavar in Hebrew, which means and Hadavar was the uh, was the what we call the supplement for the forbidden word Jehovah. They would not speak him. Exodus twenty verse seven: Thou shalt not use the Lord thy God's name in vain, for He shall require it of you. You will pay for it. So they never spoke the name of God ever again. So when they come to the name of God, they say, Hadavar, the word. Hadavar, the word. Hadavar. The var is the Hebrew word for word, and ha is the Hebrew word for the, the definite article. When John wrote the Gospel of John, he says, in beginning, in the absolute extremity of time, that's the oldest verse in the Bible in historically, in eternity past, before anything else existed, nor the plans to create anything else. In beginning, in our Cain Hologos, in beginning he kept on being the Jehovah, and the Jehovah kept on being toward the God, or an inseparable part of the Godhead, because God kept on being the Word. Not a God, but the God kept on being the Jehovah. Jesus never ceased being God when he was on earth. He was always Jehovah. The word Jehovah comes from the word Hayah in Hebrew, which means to become. And the name Jehovah means he who shall become. John 1.14 says, Kahologo sarks again, and the word flesh he became, and the Jehovah flesh he became, and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. John 1.18, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten God, the one being in the bosom Father. He has led himself out. That's from the Greek, by the way. This is beautiful. In eternity past, so when we talk about the person of God, if you don't know who the person of God is, how can you worship Him? How can you make sure that you're even saved if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is God, the Son, and Jehovah in the flesh, that He came and died for you? How do you even attain soteriology, salvation? How do you even attain soteriology? How do you even attain it? In eternity past, God was. We're going to study God, the person of God, and then we're going to study the different doctrines of the Bible as we study this systematic theology. Systematic theology. Theology with a system according to different doctrines, precepts. As we go in, I will read the book a lot and I'll do some commenting on it and we will go to scriptures. Timothy says, study, or Paul said to Timothy, study to, sh study to show thyself a workman approved to God. Study to show thyself a workman rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed rightly dividing, cutting straight the Word of God. That's what we're going to do. We're going to cut straight the Word of God. If you cut a cloth, an expensive cloth, if you cut it wrong, what happens? It's nothing but quilting material. That's all. Scraps. If you take the Word of God and you don't divide it correctly, you can destroy the person of God. You can destroy the plans of God. You can destroy everything about soteriology and theology and the very person of God. So we're going to start out here. Now we know that God created Adam and all this, but we're going to study about God and the necessity of theology. Necessity of systematic theology as we go from eternity to eternity. And the very, very necessary doctrines of the Bible. I wrote a book about 40 years ago on the doctrines of the Bible. It doesn't cover all the doctrines of the Bible, but it covers about 27 of them. Now, but today the generality of so-called theological scholarship denies that it is a science, and certainly the idea that it has the queen of the sciences. James Orr says, everyone must be aware that there is at the present time a great prejudice against doctrine and theology. Or it is, has it been called dogma in religion. 
a great distrust and dislike of clear systematic thinking about divine things. Men prefer one cannot help seeing to live in a, a region of, of haze and indefiniteness in regard to these matters. They want their thinking to be fluid and indefinite. Don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So many preachers, when they preach messages from the Word of God, so-called, it is nothing but a psychological session to make you feel better about yourself. The old time of preaching doctrines, the doctrine of hell. I preached on the doctrine of hell so many years ago one time. Well, that's the first time I ever preached on hell. And the altar was lined, and one man there, Fernando, Fernando, he came forward. Hell scared him. Hell ought to scare us. That's a doctor. Hell ought to scare us. Scare us. They want their thinking to be fluid and indefinite, something that can be changed with the times and with the circumstances and with the new lights which they think are being constantly brought to bear upon it continually thinking on new forms and leaving the old behind this is even more true today than it was when Orr wrote these words how shall we account for this state of affairs in the world today and I'm going to tell you something it's worse now than when this book was written we're living in a mass of humanity that is a believe easy world and people because it's the click thing the click thing they go to church but they don't want to hear doctrine they don't want to hear deep theological things thinking it makes my head hurt I can't sleep at night thinking about these things I've heard all of this Or indicates the basic reason. It is the present day doubt as to whether we can reach any conclusion in this field that can be regarded as certain and final. There aren't any real definite stages of doctrine in the Bible, people say. So what? We all like God. We all believe in the same God. The people today, we're having lots of problems with Islam. And they believe in the same God that we do. Let's define that God and find out whether they do or not. I assure you they do not. The God that they worship is an epigment of Muhammad's imagination. Influenced by the current philosophy of pragmatism, the modern theologian begins with a dictum that in theology, as in all other fields of inquiry, Belief must never go beyond mere setting up of a working hypothesis. It must never be expressed as something that is regarded as fixed and final. Who the person of a God is? It's how necessary is Jesus being Jehovah to the world. There's no salvation without it. Is that is it fixed? Is it final? Jesus said, heaven and earth may pass away by my word will stand. Not one jot and tittle of it. Having rejected the Bible as infallible word of God, that's, see that's another thing. Oh the word of God is written by men. Men's opinion well now that really wasn't really true that's not literal and yet it is isn't it? Having accepted the view that everything is in flux the modern theologian holds that is unsafe and to formulate any fixed views about God and theological truth. What if it does? What if he does so today, tomorrow, he may be obliged to change his opinions? Accordingly, modernistic writers seldom express any certainty with regard to anything but the most general ideas of theology. Theology means the study of God. But thank God there are still many who are not carried away by the underlying philosophy. And I'm telling you about it, there's a whole lot less of us now than there was then. 
on this book of truth. Who still believe that there are some things in the world that are stable and fixed. They point to the regularity of the heavenly bodies, the laws of nature, and the science of mathematics as the basic proofs of, for this belief. Science, mathematics is a science. Mathematics proves that evolution cannot have happened. Mathematics proves that there was a creator with a design. Science, as we know, is beginning to question the regularity even of the laws of nature, but the experienced believer in God sees in these apparent irregularities the intervention of God and the manifestations of his miraculous powers. He maintains that while the apprehension of divine revelation is progressive, the revelation in itself is as stable as a righteousness and truth of God themselves. He therefore still believes in the possibility of theology and of systematic theology. He still regards them with the same favor as do the science and the ancients. The fact is patent that even the modern student who does not formulate his theological beliefs have yet fairly definite views with regard to the major questions in his field. The reason for this is found in his own mental and moral constitution. We shall speak of this when we can come to deal with the necessity of theology. But we must first discuss the nature of theology. The nature of theology the nature of the study of God himself. The term theology is today used in a narrow and almost in a, in a broad sense. It is derived from two Greek words, theos and logos. The former meaning God and the latter mean discourse and doctrine or word. In the narrow sense, therefore, theology may be defined as a doctrine of God. But there are theological terms like election, creation, eschatology. All of these words are biblical doctrines. But in a broad and more usual sense, the term has come to mean all Christian doctrines. Not only is the specific doctrine of God, but also all the doctrines that deal with the, revel the relations of God sustains in the universe. In this broad sense, we may accordingly define theology as a science of God, the science and study of God, and his relations to the his relationship basically to the universe which he created. For the sake of further clarification of the idea, we must next indicate the differences between theology and ethics, theology and religion, and theology and philosophy. Philosophy means the study of wisdom. Theology and ethics. Theology and ethics. Psychology deals with behavior, ethics with conduct. Psychology deals with behavior. Psychology also is a Greek word which means the study of the soul. The study of the psyche is the soul. Man is basar, sarks, basar in Hebrew, sarks in Greek. He is uh, ruah. And he is Numa, Ruah in Hebrew, Numa, that's spirit. And he is Nephish and Psyche in Greek. Nephish in Hebrew, Psyche in Greek. He's triune in nature. When they accused Jesus of saying that he was God, he said, One time in my word I called you gods. Elohim. And that meant they were triune, triune entities. Psychology inquires after the how and why of behavior. Ethics after the moral quality of conduct. Ethics may be either descriptive or practical. Descriptive ethics examines human conduct in the light of some standard right or wrong. Practical ethics lays the foundation of descriptive ethics, but more particularly stresses motives to, for seeking to live up to such a standard. But as is clear in any case, philosophical ethics is developed on purely naturalistic basis and has no doctrine of sin, a savior, redemption, regeneration, divine indwelling, and enabling for the attainment 
of its goals. Christian ethics delivers great, differs greatly from philosophical ethics. It is more comprehensive in that while philosophical ethics is confined to duties between man and man, Christian ethics also include duties toward God. Furthermore, it is different in its motivation. We're on page 25. In philosophical ethics, the motive is either that of hedonism, utilitarianism, perfectionism, or a combination of all of these, or as a humanism, but in Christian ethics, the motive is, is that of affection and willing submission to God. Affection and willing submission to God. Yet even so, theology contains vastly more than belongs to Christian ethics. It includes the doctrines of the Trinity, creation, providence, the fall, the incarnation, redemption, and eschatology, as I said before. None of these belongs properly to ethics at all. Theology and religion. Theology and religion. Religion means the act of binding back again. Religion should bind a person back to God that has gone away from God. But many religions, it, if you believe in doctrine and true theology, many religions, like Mormonism, make you a God. Many religions, like Jehovah Witness, do away with the very Jehovah they say they're the witness of and the very root of their salvation. Islam totally changes the person of God. Totally changes the person of Jesus. The person of Jesus in Islam is a terrible sin. A terrible sin to say that Jesus is the Son of God. You can say he's virgin born. You can say he do miracles. But the Son of God, which is very necessary for salvation, they won't believe that. Theology and religion, the term religion is used in the greatest number of ways imaginable. It is used of the practices of fetish worship in Africa, of the Hindus chanting before an impersonal uh, absolute, of the prating of the Shinto priest and the Mohammedan Mahdi's and the Greek and Roman Catholic system, of the humanitarian and propaganda of John Hayes and Holmes, of the worship and service of the Orthodox Protestant, for this reason, some prefer not to use the term of the true Christian faith. But this question must be decided by a proper definition of religion. Hegel considered religion as a kind of knowing. Hegel. But he did not see that the kind of knowing of which the scriptures speak involves not only in the intellect, but also affections of the, and the will. Schler Makar regarded it as a mere feeling of dependence, a crutch. But he forgot that such a feeling is not religious unless it is coupled with a reliance upon God, appropriation, and a service rendered to it or to him. Kant identified it with ethics. Matthew Arnold thought of it as a morality touched with emotion. Morality touched with emotion. And Henry N. Wayman says, religion is man's acute awareness of the realm of unattained possibility and the behavior that results from this awareness. But none of these is adequate. To begin with, the etymology of the term religion is uncertain. It means the act of binding back again if you literally take the etymology of it. Augustine's derivation of legere, to bind back again, that's legere in the Latin, as man to God is doubtful for the pagan world had religion. Yes, it did. But bad religion, painted religion, unsound religion because of bad theology. But it did not have a biblical or a conception of the nature of sin, man's need of redemption, as implied in this definition. More probability in Cicero's view, he derived it from relegere to go over again and to consider. In other words, to consider and observe devotedly, especially that which pertains to the worship of the gods. From this viewpoint, then, all above practitioners and practices and systems would come under the term religion, but for strong religion, 
in its essential idea is a life in God. A life in God, a life lived in recognition of God, and a communion with God, and under control of the indwelling spirit of God. A strong systematic theology, Philadelphia. Page 21. For him, therefore, there is a strictness but one religion, the Christian religion. If we take this view of matter, then we would be justified in using the term of the Orthodox Protestant faith and worship. But we would be obliged at the same time to refuse it to all other so-called religions. Religion is religion. I spoke my last one, painted merchandising religion. Bad religion is worse than no religion at all. Islam is worse than no religion at all. Jehovah Witness is worse than no religion at all. Mormonism is worse than no religion at all. Catholicism is worse than no religion at all. Because it messes up your thinking about who God is. The relation between theology and religion is that it affects in different spheres produced by the same causes in the realm of systematic theology. The facts concerning God and his relations to the universe lead to theology, the study of God. In the sphere of individual and collective life, they lead to religion. In other words, in theology, a man organizes his thoughts concerning God and the universe, and in religion, he expresses in attitudes the actions, the effects of these thoughts produced in him. Theology and philosophy. Theology and philosophy, the love of wisdom. Theology and philosophy have practically the same objectives, but they differ very much in, the, in their approach to and method of attaining those objectives. They both seek to a comprehensive world and life view, but while theology begins with belief in the existence of God and the idea that he is the cause of all things excepting sin, philosophy begins with some other thing at given and the idea that is sufficient to explain the existence of all things. For the Greek philosophers, this thing given was either water or air or fire. Remember they had the song in Moriah. Mm -hmm. It's either water, air, or fire, and the atoms in motion, noose, idea, mind. For the moderns, it is nature, the modern, what we call the new age people, real true philosophy is the total respect of all things. We need to respect all things because that all things are God's. Mm -hmm. We don't need to go tear down a mountain because that's God's mountain. We don't need to go do things to destroy the environment because it's God's environment and it's set in order. But we can go too far and not respect that. For the moderns, it is nature or mind and personality or life or some other thing. Theology does not merely begin with the belief in the existence of God, but also holds that he has graciously revealed himself so that he could be known. Philosophy denies both of these ideas from the idea of God and the study of divine revelation. The theologian begins his word and life view from the things given and the supposed powers inherent in the philosopher develops his world and life view. It is thus clear that theology rests upon a solid objective basis while philosophy rests upon the assumptions and speculations of the philosopher. They merchandise this in Paul's day. Yet philosophy has a definite value for the theologian and in the first place it furnishes him some support for his Christian position. Kant, on the basis of conscience, argued for the existence of God. Freedom and immorality. Henry Bergson supports the idea that men know by way of intuition, intuition as well as by way of reason. Various philosophers had argued uh, for the independence of mind and brain and have sought to set forth the relations between them. The theologian may use such philosophy conclusions in support of biblical positions. In the second place, it reveals to him the inadequacy of reason and to solve the basic 
problems of existence. Paul said, let me be ignorant. Let me be ignorant of all the philosophies, yet he knew them. Peter, they called the dumb fisherman, knew the philosophies. He quoted them. He used those terms. Paul used those philosophical terms to reach his philosophical subjects that had come to know Christ. While the theologian appreciates all real hell that he gets from philosophy, yet he quickly discovers the philosophy has no real theory of origins and no doctrines of providence, sin, salvation, and final consummation. Since all these concepts are very vital to an adequate world and life view, the theologian is irresistible driven by God. Irresistibly driven by God and the revelation he has made of himself for a treatment of these doctrines. And in the third place, it acquaints him with the views of educated of the educated unbeliever. I think we ought to have an educated laity in churches, educated in the word of God. Preachers today don't even study Greek and Hebrew. It's too much work. They don't need it. But there's where so many secrets are hidden of theology. Philosophy is to the unbeliever what the Christian faith is to the believer. And he adheres to it with the same tenacity with which the believer adheres to his faith and to know a man's philosophy is therefore to get possession of the key to understanding him also in dealing with him the believer may not be able to do much with a theoretical philosopher but he will be able to help him who is not yet fully committed to the theories of speculation and right there is where we're going to start do we have any questions <clears throat> yes. Yes, this is what you're studying the um, systematic theology. That's already in the Bible, isn't it? God revealed Himself. Yeah. It is the dogmas and the doctrines of the Bible yeah. of who He is and who God is. We have no room for leniency and lateral or vertical movements away from the person of God. So just Islam it. says that no one can approach God. The Bible says that we can approach God through the blood of his son. Catholicism uses Mary as the intercessor. Jesus is the intercessor. Jehovah's Witnesses do away with Jesus altogether, make him the Archangel Michael and that he is not God at all. Mm -hmm. No way. Mormonism makes them each each man a god, and Jesus is their older brother. And Mo Joseph Smith was a descendant of Jesus through Mary. This is bad theology, people. Mary Baker Eddy, that there is no such reality as the world. It's our imagination. See, illnesses are not there. All of this is imagination. It was all her imagination. That woman died. She had illnesses. Yet she denied them. Theology is a very important course. Mm -hmm. And it's so important that I'm going to try to teach it and go through this book. Mm -hmm. Chapter by chapter. Page by page. Any other questions? Let's have a word of prayer. Go out and do something eternal with your theology. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the study of you in theology. Help us to open our minds to it. Help us to bless people out there as we go. That there is really a standard by which we read from your word. Forgive us for our failure. In Jesus' name we pray.